When I was about 9 or 10, I was invited to a classmate's birthday party at some swimming baths. All of us were the same age. It was a small class of about 20 kids, and I'm pretty sure everyone was invited. Just to clarify, I'm male. Anyway, I kind of got separated from everyone, and it was just me and this girl alone. I wasn't particularly close friends with her, but I did know her as she was in my class. To describe the location we were in, it was in a tunnel that connected the main wave pool to a lazy river. There wasn't really anybody else there. It was just me and her when she suddenly lunged at me without warning. She grabbed my head and held it underwater. I was a pretty skinny kid and she was bigger than me and a bit of a tomboy. About 20 seconds went by as I furiously tried to free myself, but she wasn't letting go. Fight or flight and mass panic took over and I eventually fought my way free. I was coughing and spluttering water as I emerged. I remember looking at her and just being in shock. I think I began to ask why she did that when she lunged at me again. She again held my head underwater for what felt like a lifetime before I fought my way free. Both times I genuinely thought I was going to drown and she never let me up. I had to fight my way free. I couldn't swim at the time, but the water in the lazy river and tunnel was just maybe chest high. I began to backpedal away from her. She was giggling as if it was funny and had this kind of crazed look and grin on her face. I couldn't just climb out to escape as it was a tunnel, so I had to try and get out of there. As I was backpedaling, she was following me and I made sure to keep distance so she couldn't lunge at me again but she was gaining on me. I actually managed to reason with her as I was so scared of her I was babbling at her. I tried to distract her by suggesting we go down the water slide together. It worked as I could see her thinking about it and she stopped chasing me. I managed to exit the tunnel and water and she slowly followed me but seemed a bit unsure. I immediately felt more safe as I was out of the water and could see other people about as we headed towards the slides. I kept talking all the way up about how fun the slides were and whatnot, but she didn't really speak at all and had a really strange look on her face the full time. Anyway, after we went down the slides, I caught up with my friends and just stuck with them the rest of the time as I was a bit shaken up. I never told them about it as it was a bit embarrassing to admit a girl had tried to drown me and I was worried I would get teased. Anyway, fast forward to adulthood. This girl is now in a relationship with another woman. Her partner had two or three kids from a previous relationship with a guy. It turns out they would torture the kids and eventually killed one of them. She's currently serving a life sentence in prison. I told my friends about the swimming pool incident after hearing about her crimes, and I'm pretty sure they think I'm just bullshitting, as none of them took me seriously. Maybe as I kind of lightheartedly said I was almost victim number one. However, nonetheless, it's a bit crazy to think back, as she obviously was a genuine psychopath, and if I'd never fought her off me to escape, and then convinced her to go down that slide, I genuinely believe she could have killed me. I have lived in New York City all of my life, but this ranks as one of my oddest encounters. I probably owe my life to someone I met only briefly. It was about 30 years ago, and I was coming out of my dentist who was located on a desolate side street between Penn Station and 7th Avenue, not far from Macy's Herald Square. At about 6.30 p.m., my dental work finished and the sun just started to set. I walked out of the appointment only to run into a man who repeatedly, intentionally body slammed me while pretending it was an accident. I had formed an intention to say nothing, but to slowly edge my way closer and closer to the open door of a chock full of nuts and make a quick dash for the entrance. Again and again, the man said, Excuse me, miss, and slammed into me from the street side as I tried to pick my way across the sidewalk to the open door. He must have stepped back and hit me six or eight times when out of nowhere, 
a large man stepped forward and said, Miss, where are you going? Terrified that they were a tag team, I said, I'm trying to make my way to the 6th Avenue subway entrance at Macy's. This mysterious guy grabbed me and propelled me so quickly the couple of blocks to the subway that my feet didn't touch the ground. Even though I was a young woman of large size and a former distance runner who could move with great speed, the mystery man took me right to the train, then disappeared. My dad said he was probably a plainclothes cop. I'll never know who he was or what the other guy was trying to pull, but I will always be grateful for having been saved from something quite potentially bad. I used to work night shift at a gas station in Florida straight out of high school. It was a great job. It was so slow that the other cashier and I would hang out front and smoke cigarettes if we didn't have customers, and sometimes a friend or two would drop by. Well, one night we were doing just that, and we see a truck coming up the road being pushed by four guys, and followed closely by a police car and another car. The truck is clearly out of gas. And having worked there for a while, this is more common than people think. We figure the police car is slowly riding behind them so that another car doesn't slam into them. This is a normal procedure for police in my city. Well, the exact moment the truck is pushed up to a pump, a whole swarm of police cars fly into the only entrance of the gas station, completely blocking it off. All of the cops are now aiming their AR-15s and Glocks at the guys who pushed the truck yelling at them to get on the ground and not move. One of the guys started reaching in the truck, and I thought he was about to get blown away. I should mention that the angle of the attack put us in line of fire. After they arrest two of the guys, we find out they'd robbed another gas station up the street. Apparently, the truck's description didn't match, but they got the license plate right, and when the cop pulled behind the truck to make sure they didn't get hit, he ran the plates and called for backup. I used to love that job. For as long as I can remember, I've seen shadows and heard creaking, closing doors, misplaced items, and other unexplainable things throughout my childhood home. I've always watched horror movies and scared myself by reading creepypastas, which means I had several different escape routes planned out, depending on where the serial killer that was obviously going to come for me tried to get in. One day when I was in high school, I was home alone after school, sitting in the living room watching TV. From the mudroom that connects the living room to the garage, I heard a loud bang like someone smashing their fist against the door connecting the garage and the mudroom. I ran up to the kitchen with my phone, grabbed a knife, and peeked over the counter out the window towards the front of the house. No one is outside, there were no cars, and the garage door was still closed, meaning no one got into the garage, and no wind slammed the door. I eventually talked myself out of the whole serial killer thing, but I haven't been able to explain it, and it hasn't happened again. A different night. My parents were gone when I went to sleep. I wake up to knocking on my bedroom door. My parents wouldn't have knocked to check in on me sleeping. Without access to a weapon, I froze, because obviously this time it's going to be the serial killer. I just laid there for ten minutes. I never heard any footsteps, nothing. I got up and went to my parents' room. They were both fast asleep, so it's not even like they just come home when I heard the knocking. On a different day, I set a water bottle on the kitchen counter and kept walking towards the hallway. A couple of seconds later, I hear the bottle fall, but when I get back into the kitchen, the bottle is across the room. And yet another day, I was home alone in the living room when I heard a sneeze from the back towards the bedrooms. My first instinct was to say, bless you. My second thought was, didn't my boyfriend leave 30 minutes ago? And during college, I came home for a break. I had to sleep in the loft bed. I brought my sister's dog up with me because she liked to cuddle. 
I was woken up by the feeling and sound of someone climbing up the ladder, which I was very acquainted with at the time. I could feel my sister's dog against my leg laying between me and the edge. When I felt something pet down the blanket like they were petting the dog, I must have moved because the dog realized I was awake and immediately turned around to jump onto my chest with her ears down, shaking. The intensity of the events is toned down quite a bit, but for a stretch of time, something wanted to make itself known. So this happened when I was 14 or 15 and often stayed over at my cousin's and her husband's house. We'll call them Skylar and Josh, female 24, male 26 at the time. I had been staying at their house for a week straight prior to the incident with no issues. It was during the summertime in a neighborhood that was pretty rapidly expanding. You know those monochrome suburban nightmare cul-de-sacs. There are tons of those half-finished houses lining the far end of the neighborhood. I feel this info is pretty important. Anyways, Josh and I were avid movie watchers and stayed up most nights watching whatever looked good. That night, Skylar went to bed early and we stayed up to watch Would You Rather and then Ridiculous 6. Movie sucks by the way. Semi-important context. Josh is a smoker and goes out to the back patio for a cigarette every so often especially at night when he takes their beagle, Banjo, out to pee. I ended up sleeping through the movie on one of their two couches. The couch is backed against the wall and to the left of it is a window into the backyard. It was the only window in the living room. At some point, I keep hearing Banjo whomping and hollering in the playroom, then again in the kitchen, then the playroom, and so on and so forth. The dog is going apeshit in literally every room on the first floor, but he is a clingy dog that hated when Skylar and Josh shut him out of the room, so I figured he was just whining. He's also a beagle, so we're used to him being vocal. In hindsight, I probably should have wondered why he was running from room to room. Whatever. I tried to sleep through it. After a good while of Banjo flipping his shit in what I think is a kitchen, he kinda goes quiet. But he wakes me up again growling at the window right next to the couch I'm sleeping on. He would not be still. I still didn't get up. I fell back asleep for a bit. Then out of nowhere, he jumps on the couch right next to my stomach and starts losing his shit barking and howling. That wasn't what woke me up though. It was a light shining from the outside of the window right in my face. I wasn't scared at first, more confused than anything, since my eyes hadn't adjusted at that point. Then the flashlight shines up right on the man's face and he looks identical to Josh. Could have been twins. He's crouched down with his face almost right against the glass and when I see him, I jump really hard. I don't remember if I screamed but the man started laughing at me. I can hear from the other side of the window. However, because I'm big stupid, I assume Josh is on a smoke break just trying to spook me. I start walking upstairs and as I passed their kitchen clock, it was like 4 a.m. I didn't even put two and two together that Josh had no reason to be outside or awake at this hour. I'm so groggy but also unnerved at this point, so I go to sleep on the upstairs hallway floor. I didn't go alert Skylar of what just happened, mostly because she's a cranky bitch when you wake her up and I was still more willing to accept the idea that it was Josh being an idiot on a smoke break rather than some maniac scoping the house. The next afternoon I bring it up to them and they sort of write it off, ask me if I'm sure that I wasn't dreaming, etc. But they did say they heard the dog going wild. I check outside where the window is to see if the man dropped any evidence of him being there and I kinda wanna vomit. The tall grass around the house was pressed down like someone was on their knees. I don't even want to know how long this man was sitting there on the grass to have it pressed down still, but I have a feeling that it was pretty long. Banjo sat by the window for a hot minute and the flashlight thing was the only thing that woke me up. I'm glad I saw the grass though because it felt so much like a fever dream. Sometimes I still wonder if it happened, 
but I know it did. My theory is some squatter in one of the unfinished houses was either bored or on something and decided to go on an adventure. But yeah, I would have absolutely gotten my shit rocked in a horror movie at that age. A bit of context. I'm a 22 year old female. I'm petite, really pale, and always with messy hair. I was wearing loose clothes, all white. I was outside smoking while sitting on a chair in my front yard. I forgot to mention an essential detail. I live in the countryside. My street leads to fields and forests. The night here hits differently, if you know what I mean. This guy offers some great masterpieces freely to our starry eyes. So yes, I was just hyper-focusing on the sky. I just stood up and decided to take a picture. I wanted to reproduce it through painting. However, I was really disappointed by my lame camera, so I decided to head inside to grab one of my parents' phones since their quality was better. While I was trying to take some pictures, I felt a gaze on me. It was my new neighbor. She was staring right at me. I was in my front garden just in front of her house. I was waiting since in my front yard there's an automatic light. It flashes at any movement and lasts for like 20 seconds, so I was only visible for a moment. It was pitch dark again. There are no street lights where I live, so I was relieved to feel invisible. As I was finally taking mesmerized pictures, out of the blue, the flash of the phone I was holding started to light up. The moon was right on the left side of her house, so yeah, it looked like I was taking photos of her house. I heard her screaming. I put my hand on the flashlight and turned it off. I was petrified. I didn't know which option was the best. A. Fleeing right away into my house so I had to reactivate the flash, looking suspicious. B. Confront her and explain the whole situation because I scared her quite often. Or C. Just disappearing in the dark and waiting. Okay, so I'm a night owl and I love art. It's not unusual to see me outside standing right in front of my house or in the middle of the driveway past midnight taking pictures, smoking, or just contemplating so I spooked her multiple times. I know because she said that I was the weird neighbor to someone. One day, I was playing in the front yard, playing with my cat with a red laser pointer, obviously late at night. I accidentally pointed my laser to one of her windows, so a bright red dot was visible. I heard her screaming, turn the light on in the room. I turned off the laser and I glanced at her. She looked at me and shut the curtains. Back to the story. The option I decided to choose was to not move and wait. Then I was like, I guess I should still continue taking pictures. I heard loud voices, the front door opened. I heard them walking slowly towards their car and whispering. What was I supposed to do? I took one last picture and headed to my house. As the flash went on, I was petting my cat. I heard her again saying, Again, this weird chick. As soon as I closed the door, I laughed out loud. I guess it was a nervous reaction. Maybe I should find a way to talk to her, reassure her that I'm inoffensive, or I guess I could just remain the weird neighbor. When I was 15, I had a crush on this girl from a different city who unfortunately had their house burned down by a meth addict neighbor. She called me immediately to let me know what happened and I told her I will go as soon as I can. I really meant it because after I got off the phone, I changed clothes and sneaked out of the house. I think it was already 3 or 4 am and I had no means of getting to the bus stop unless I walk. The bus stop was pretty far from where I live so I was switching between running and walking. If I get tired, I'll sit down for a couple of minutes at the old cold pavement before walking and running again. While resting under one of the light posts at the other side of the road, 
I saw someone riding a motorcycle at a very slow pace. I can also hear music from the motorcycle. I guess they saw me sitting because they turned and drove towards my direction. I did not think it was strange. I kept sitting there until the motorcycle stopped in front of me. On the motorcycle was a guy who appeared to be in his 30s, skinny, bald and pale. Tied to his neck is a rope attached to a small radio player. It was playing music, but at a very low volume. Where are you going? He asked. Me, having absolutely no sense of stranger danger, told him I'm going to the bus stop. He said, you won't catch the bus if you just walk. I notice this guy is very giggly. It's like every time he talks, he finds it funny or silly. I told him it was okay and I could walk very fast. But it's dark, he told me. If you want, I can give you a ride. He says this with a very white smile. Since I'm very stupid and I just want to go to my friend as soon as I can, with a sparkle in my eye, I said, Sure. I hopped on the motorcycle and we began cruising the streets. While riding, I notice he makes sudden short breaks that cause me to move closer to his back. When I pull myself away, he would do these stops again. A couple of minutes on the ride, I realized he went the wrong way. I told him he missed the correct turn, but he was not responding. He increased the volume of the radio and drove faster instead. That's when I thought this guy would do something terrible to me. I'd rather break my kneecaps than be killed by this guy. I jumped off the moving motorcycle like Evil Knievel. I landed on my feet but lost balance and fell on my ass. I couldn't stand because my knees were shaking and I had gashes on my palms. The guy shouted, You motherfucker! As his motorcycle wiggles, almost crashing. I thought to myself, If this guy turns around, I'm absolutely going to die today. Thankfully, he kept on. Even limping, I managed to walk towards the bus stop. I went and visited the girl to make sure she was okay. I also had my first kiss that day. My name is Rick Martinez and I'm a retired truck driver. This happened when I was like 30 years old. I'm now 62. On the road, I see many strange things. I've told this story over and over. A lot of people don't believe me, but it starts off in Stockton, California, where I picked up a load of pipe. My destination was Salt Lake City, Utah. I was supposed to refuel in Barstow, California at a truck stop, but lo and behold, they were out of fuel. So I told my supervisor, hey, I got like half a tank of fuel. He told me to continue and hit the first truck stop I see. So 100 miles into Nevada, I see nothing but a sparsely lit desert with a couple of towns. When I noticed my gauge set was reading empty, I think to myself, that's not right. So I took the first exit I saw and pulled over. I told my supervisor, who was right behind me an hour away, that I was afraid to continue on and run the tanks dry. So he told me to sit still and he would be by in an hour and we could siphon some of the fuel from his tank into mine. So I sat there and I noticed that it was a small town with sparse lighting. As I sat there, I couldn't run the engine, so I couldn't listen to the radio. I sat there in silence. I don't do drugs and I didn't make this up, so listen carefully. As I'm sitting there, I notice a lot of undone construction, a trailer park to my right completely dark, and a church off to my left about a block away with its lights on. It's about 2am and I see this jackrabbit hopping around my truck. It hops around and just stares at me and keeps hopping around. So I'm getting hungry and I notice what looks to be a convenience store another block away from the church. So I get out of the truck and decide to walk to the store. While I'm walking, I keep hearing this dog howling like it's in pain. As I'm passing the church, two of the doors are wide open 
and I hear clapping like they're having a service. I look inside, and there's no one except for the skinny white old man reading from the Bible and talking about hell. I don't linger too long and continue on my way. I then hear clapping again, and that's about the time the dog starts to howl once more. I notice there's a bunch of empty houses on the street that goes uphill. I'm still making my way towards what I think is a little mini-mart. All this time, the dog keeps howling. All the lights are on, and as I go inside, this little old lady with glasses is reading a book. There's hardly anything in this store. Maybe a few cans of food, a couple of bags of chips, and only water in the refrigerators. This whole time, the lady didn't even pick her head up from the book. So I grab a water and get some chips. I'm hungry as hell and there's nothing to eat. So I ask the old lady, is this all you have? Where is everybody at? She told me everybody moved out and new construction was supposed to begin like six months ago. She didn't say anything after that. So I paid her and walked out and started walking back towards the truck. The whole time the dog is still howling. So as I get closer towards the church, I looked up the street towards where I heard the howling from. I decided to go see for myself why the dog was howling. The houses on both sides of the street are boarded up and dark. I saw a house with the lights on, with about a five foot fence. When I looked over the fence, I was in shock. What I saw was a man in his underwear with a chain attached to his neck on all fours howling. The hairs on my arms and neck stood up as I saw this other man burst through the back door and kick the man on all fours and was yelling at him to shut up. The man on all fours ran into a doghouse. I was in shock and turned and ran back down the hill to my truck. As I passed the church, both doors still wide open, but there were no lights on anymore and I could still hear the clapping. Finally, I made it to my truck and called my supervisor. I reported what I saw. I told him to hurry up and get here so I can leave. My supervisor asked what exit I was talking about, and I told him. He said, Oh, I passed that. He had to turn around and come back to get me. So I'm sitting there, and the rabbit is still hopping around my truck. It stopped and looked up at me as I was sitting in my truck. I'm not saying the rabbit said it, but this is what I heard. Leave. I rolled up the window and waited for my supervisor, who showed up about five minutes after. I told my supervisor what happened, and he just laughed at me and told me that he's going to drug test me. I did not sleep on that whole trip to Utah until I got to Salt Lake City. Believe it or not, I swear this is what happened. A good lesson for kids about stranger danger. This was four years ago. I was 15 and loved puzzles. I wanted to buy one but didn't have much money, so I went out with my sister looking for some random toy stores that sold off-brand and cheap toys. We found one in an area of town that didn't have much activity around. It didn't really look like a toy store in the front, and when you walked in, you could see the shelves were full and looked like they hadn't been rearranged in years. It kind of seemed like the store didn't really have a reason to be there. There was a man at the cash register who noticed our coming in. I didn't really get a weird vibe from him or the store. It was just empty. So we look around and there are no puzzles. So I go up to the man and ask him, Hey, I can't seem to find any puzzles. Do you know if there are any that I'm missing? The man answers, Oh, yeah, there are puzzles. They're downstairs. I didn't see any downstairs when we entered the store. But I was like, Sure, show me the puzzles. This was like the third store we tried, so I just wanted to find my toy, you guys. The man walks around the corner and to this door that you wouldn't notice unless it was pointed at. He opened it and it revealed a steep staircase going down. At the bottom was a plain wall, 
you would have to go left or right to enter whatever the room was. It didn't seem like there were toys down there. It was also kind of dark down there too. Also, if there really was a downstairs to this door, wouldn't the door be open? At that moment, I got that stomach drop and the get the fuck out of there man feeling. The man was looking at me, waiting for my sister and I to walk down in front of him. I was like, uh, I, uh, well, uh, oh, my mom is calling me, I'll be right back. My sister and I got the hell out of there, and I've never even been close to that store since. Maybe there were puzzles down there, maybe there weren't, but I was definitely not going to stay and find out. It's very important to be careful in this sort of situation, because if I was right, and the man did have bad intentions, then if I'd taken even just one step closer to the stairs, he could have pushed me down at that moment, and there would have definitely been no possible escape. So don't go down Radlam's stairs, y'all. Stay safe. Years ago, I was walking my dog with my sister at a farm right by my house. The farm owner, a nice lady who still runs it today, let the public use her farm and woods for free to walk their dogs as long as the dog stayed on their leads when by the farm animal pens and fields. The farm was quite big and if you walk further in, there's little woods at the back of it which are normally quite deserted. We always feel safe walking here though because we've both known the farm owner since we were babies and the walls surrounding the farm are massive and couldn't be easily climbed over, if that makes sense. Anyway, we go into the farm and make our way to the woods because in the woods we can let our dog off the lead. After we let him off his lead, he starts walking around. The woods go in a big circle around the farm, so we usually just do a lap of the woods before coming back into the farm and going home. We were walking along chatting, and then sitting ahead of us on a fallen down tree log was a man. He was just sitting there. What I mean is, he wasn't drinking coffee he had bought from the little farm shop at the farm. He didn't have a dog with him. He was just sitting on the log staring straight ahead at the trees and the woods. We carry on walking, and as we come close to him, he suddenly looks over at us quite quickly and says, The only way out of this place is over there in this monotone voice and points at the woods, which is a part of the woods that just leads to more woods and then to a brick wall that surrounded the farm. We just ignored him and carried on walking. We told the lady who owns the farm that there was a man in the woods and she said she hadn't seen anyone go in there before us, but asked us nevertheless what he was doing. We said he wasn't doing anything, just sitting there, but we did tell her what he said to us. She looked confused and went into the woods with us and asked us to show her where he had been, so we did. We showed her where he had pointed and she said, That leads to the wall that used to separate the farm and the railroad tracks. Apparently, years before there was a railway next to the farm that just stopped being used for whatever reason, some 30 years before. Now just sits there overgrown and desolate. Don't know what that man meant about that being the only way of the woods, but the whole thing made me feel unnerved. We never saw him again, and neither did the farm owner. When I was 19, my best friend was diagnosed with stage 4 ovarian cancer. We knew her cancer was terminal and she had a life expectancy of five years at most. Her and I would talk every now and then about passing on, and how even though I was healthy, I could always go before her in a crash or some other way. We made a pact that no matter which one of us left first, we would come back to the other and let them know that there was more to life after death. She eventually passed away from her illness at 22 years old, leaving behind her husband and her three-year-old son. She passed away on a Sunday at 8.20am. I remember the call from her husband vividly. 
He asked me to bring her son to the hospital because she'd passed away. That day was a complete blur. I couldn't find myself to come to the reality that she was no longer with us. It all felt unreal. We were allowed to be with her for a few hours in her hospital room before she was taken away. But while we were there with her, I don't know. I was in complete shock and my mind just couldn't process it. I didn't cry. Leaving the hospital was so strange because at the time I had no children and my life revolves around my work, my home, and her. She lived a few minutes from my job at the time, so I would always leave work very early to see her, whether she was at home or the hospital. I loved her so much. I could never be away from her. So now knowing I had to go home and trying to process I would never see her again, just threw my life for a spin. That night I couldn't sleep. I just kept trying to make sense of it all. In all honesty, I don't even remember the thoughts that were going through my head, but the feelings of loss and confusion were very prevalent in me. I couldn't sleep at all, but at around three in the morning, I felt the most beautiful and reassuring feeling I've ever felt. I felt what I can only describe as a warm hug take over me from head to toe, and I fell asleep. That night, I had a dream. In my dream, I called her husband to let me know that she'd written me a letter. He then tells me it's funny because she left him a voicemail. He then asks me to read him the letter, so I read it to him. In this letter, she tells us how thankful she is that we were in her life. She thanked us for taking care of her and loving her. She asks us to please watch over her son and that she's okay and no longer in pain. She also tells us that we will be okay. As I finish telling him about the letter, my mom comes into my room and wakes me up. She asks me for a pen and paper. I hand her a piece of paper I had and she starts to write. When she finishes, she hands it to me, saying she didn't know why, but something told her to write this and give it to me. When I read the letter, it was word for word what my best friend told me in my dream, and she signed it with her father's last name. Now, my mom only knows her by her mother's last name. No one outside her close relatives and myself knew her father's last name, so I was very confused as to how she signed it with her father's last name. I asked why or how she wrote this. My mom didn't know. She just wrote. I explained to her about my dream, and she was as surprised as I was. I immediately called her husband and told him about the letter in my dream. He agreed they were all her words. My best friend came through with her promise. This made me a believer. I know there's more after death. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Diana Johnston Vampy Debs Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel DeLuna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Amber Hops, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, 
Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoed, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.